Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays of the month. The first Sunday of the month, I do a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. I have enough photos <laughs> for, the, uh, for the May video, uh, for sure. Uh, I normally, on these question and answer videos, ask for photos. I have enough, for sure. There's probably between eight and 10 minutes worth of photos that have already been uh, sent. It's uh, uh, probably a couple hundred emails uh, at this point. So um, I'll ask for more uh, next month for the, uh, for the uh, June, uh, the early June video. Thank you guys for participating in that video. This time of year, there's so many people watching that uh, you know, I tend to just get overwhelmed when I, when I throw out that request for photos. Again, thanks for participating. And the ones that have been sent to me will be in the first Sunday in May video. I won't have a question and answer video uh, next week. Um, I've got some um, uh, family plan stuff um, over at uh, my son's. My son graduated in November, but of course, because um, from, from Elon University, but of course, because of a weird year, graduation stuff uh, and other um, ceremonies are this spring. So um, some of those things are coming up and that's what I'll be doing uh, next weekend. Um, Lots of video content coming this week. I'm gonna start putting some of my warm season stuff in the ground, but I need, um, uh, be thinking about, be watching your forecast out from your average last frost date. One of the confusions here on the last frost rate date thing, and, and I get a lot of comments like this, now that my, my frost date is passed, I'm gonna go start, can I start planting? It's your average last frost date. So my average last frost date, I think in, Raleigh is actually like April 12th. I always say April 15th, but I think it's something like April 12th is our average last frost date. That means probably 50% of all frost <laughs> happened after uh, that date, uh, if that makes any sense. So it's just your, it's the average day that this happens to land on. And there are years, I remember a few years ago, we didn't get a frost after you know mid-February. And so you know that being averaged in, that means there's probably times that we've gotten uh, frost and freezes well into May, and I've seen that. Um, I've seen two. Um, uh, when I had my nursery, and I had a pretty devastating event uh, on a, uh, a very late Easter freeze that we had years ago. It was like the last 28th, 29th of April, something like that. We had two 25 degree nights, which not, so we're not talking about frost, we're talking about two hard freezes uh, that were pretty devastating to a lot of guys in the nursery business who had already had all their stuff flush out. They had taken plastic off their houses, you know, it was pretty bad. Everybody had, you know, replanted tomatoes and everything uh, that year. That was maybe 15, 18 years ago, something, something like that. Anyway, doesn't matter. Just when you, when you get to what is your average last frost date, be looking at the 10 day forecast beyond. Uh, like this week, I have two nights that are 40 degrees. That's not a frost, obviously. But tomatoes don't like 40 degrees, uh, neither do my dahlias. I'm gonna put my dahlias in this week, but they really don't like uh, 40 degrees. They actually like soil temperature around 60. And so uh, keep that in mind. Now there's a lot of things that it just won't bother at all. There's a, you know, marigolds are one of those things that can almost take a light frost and not be, and not worry. But if you don't know what those things are or not, you know, just, you know, continue to just monitor your weather uh, and make sure that you're not gonna see a frost out, you know, 10 days. Anything on the forecast in the thirties that's, you know, within 10 days out, um, you know, that can easily adjust down to 35, 34, 33 real quick on a forecast. Uh, so keep that in mind. So that's what I'm looking for on the forecast. Right now I've got a 40 degree night on Wednesday night. It's supposed to be clear, calm winds. You know, if I see that um, all of a sudden that forecast dropped to 37 or something, we could easily see frost in outlying areas on a night like that. So just keep that in mind. It's your average uh, last frost date. Uh, that, that was a lot of questions. Um, in, in, the, in the questions from last week is about when to start planting and that kind of thing. So I have all of my stuff ready to go in the ground. I am past my average last frost date now, but I am still a little bit cautious from years of having done this. There you go. Uh, let's see. Uh, I got a question about my, whether my new gold lantana was waking up in the front yard yet, and no, it's not. And I had a I've got a landscape um, that I walk past frequently. I did a tour video there over in uh, uh, Cameron Park, which isn't, isn't too far from me. Last, last year, I put up a, a video from that house and I, I saw hers are big, giant established ones that she cuts back every winter that haven't started to come back either. So I just think that, they're, that new gold is just slightly later than some other uh, lantanas. I'm not concerned about it. I didn't have a winter that was a lantana killing kind of winter. So um, I expect to see them, but they are for whatever reason, a little later than some other lantanas. 
this i uh, put up a video for the drone uh over the yard two days ago if you guys haven't seen that video of just planning where all the stones and things are going that i'm per in the process of bringing in and somebody wanted to know uh, where i get stone in the raleigh area and i go over to scott stone on yonkers road uh, which is a uh, uh, southeast uh, raleigh area and uh, that's where I, i've gone when i got project things for my landscape projects in the past and that kind of thing but uh it's scott stone on yonkers road all of you all across the country have you know stone yards near cities i think i probably have five six seven choices within you know 10 miles of where i am right now but scott stone is the one i use uh somebody asked about tree forming uh snowball viburnum they were replacing some trees and they were putting in some snowball viburnum i planted one over there uh the other day and want to go about tree forming them and how, how much they can cut on them when they plant them when you're tree forming something and you're first putting it in the ground i wouldn't do any pruning on it i'd let the thing get established for a little while and then uh and once it starts to once it gets rooted in starts to put on some new growth looks like it's happy and healthy in that space that's when i would start pruning on it and start training it uh just 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 my opinion i think i always talk about double stresses you know if you put something in the ground and you hack away at it or you know you put something in the ground and then decide to move it two days later or you put something in the ground that just got frost damage or you put you know what i mean you, where you double down on um a stress that a plant already has uh, i don't ever think is a good idea so plant it let it become established and then start working on tree forming them okay um somebody said i should do a, a video on crazy uh, on the crazy questions i get um a crazy i should do one on crazy comments i get some some pretty funny comments and i know now not to ever look at comments right when i wake up because the uh, the craziest comments <laughs> happen happen after 2 a.m uh, I, I know that the the ones that i see first thing in the morning are not not ones that i want to be reading so uh but uh and maybe one day i will do a crazy question uh uh, uh video uh let's see um let's see uh i did the frost date is average thing i started with that uh let's see Okay, so somebody has a camellia. Um, camellias come up in this questions a lot, this, but this really doesn't have anything to do with camellias necessarily. They have a camellia that was in a shaded space and then they cut down a tree and now it's in uh, full sun. And what should they plant to kind of shade uh, the plant? I don't know that you're gonna be able to plant anything that's gonna come up really quickly and shade the plant and uh, prevent this first summer from you know, doing some potential damage to it. What I would encourage you to do is shade the roots. Make sure that they're well mulched and uh, maybe even uh, some ground cover items that you could plant around it, maybe some annual, um, even creeping jenny, anything that you can put around the base of that plant to keep those roots cool. The roots are gonna be more vulnerable than the top of the plant. Um, old established plants have more of an ability to adapt you know, to those types of changes, but if the sun is just slamming those roots, uh, you, you, could, you, you could see some damage that way. So keeping the roots cool, keeping it you know, watered this first summer, uh, uh, would, would, would be your best bet. And I think that camellia, you may find that it adapts better to that space uh, than you think it will just because it's older and established uh, and old established plants, like I say, tend to be, tend to be more uh, uh, flexible <laughs> in, 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 with changes. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, so, oh, somebody um, got, it was an Encore Azalea they bought and which doesn't matter what it is, but they realized that they have a second plant that was in the pot and they want to know how to separate that separate plant not a not another encore azalea just some other foreign plant it was, it's likely just some sort of weed uh that uh you know a squirrel put in the pot at the nursery or something like that and wanted to know if they should dig it up and try to separate it. i wouldn't dig it up and try to separate it i'd follow that one that you're trying to get out down to the base and i just cut it uh flush right at the ground and then it's going to try to come back a couple more times and you could just continue to do the same thing it may take a year uh, to kill it but just keep cutting off its ability to grow down at the bottom but i wouldn't risk killing my encore azalea um you know trying to pull that one away from it uh it may be the majority of the roots down there are this other thing whatever it is uh, so no definitely i'm not pulling it up and trying to separate them and killing my encore azalea i'm just going to go down cut that one out then it's going to try to come back i'm going to cut it out again no big deal five six times you do this you probably will um, be able to eliminate that other plant Okay, um, which is how kind of persistence that I use on things like English ivy and other other weedy things. Um, you know, the liriope that was in this yard, the mondo grass was in this yard. I'm just persistent, you know, at 
yeah, every time I see them, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone. And they just gets, it just, the, the problem gets lessened over time, but there's no way to like instantly solve it. It takes months uh, to solve those kinds of things or years even sometimes. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody asked me about the percentage of pine bark soil conditioner that I would use when I'm planting in clay. My old clay planting video, I don't know, half of, half of you subscribe to this channel maybe from that video. I have no idea. Uh, that video has hundreds of thousands of views. Uh, uh, that, um, the percent, I, I probably use between a third and a half pine bark soil conditioner to clay if I can find it, uh, if I have heavy clay soils. Keep in mind, there's a lot of research that just says you don't need to do anything. Just plant in the native soil and go with it. Um, and I think that that's probably right, um, you know, on a lot of tough, on a lot of tough plants. But that doesn't take into account that, that we're trying to grow some plants in, in spaces they just flat out don't want to be. And like azaleas don't want to be in clay soil. So yes, uh, planting directly in the native soil um, probably gives you most plants the best long-term, you know, fight through it. <laughs> just put them in the ground, tell them to fight through it. Uh, but the fact that we get so much water here in our clay soils, you know, when we dig little clay pots in the ground, basically, um, you know, they become places where water can stand and that kind of thing. I do think it's a good idea to use something to create some drainage in that clay. And here's another long answer uh, from Jim. But I would say between a third and maybe 50% pine bark soil conditioner to the clay that you pull out of the hole for any plant that I worry about root rot uh, on in, in clay soils. And that can be rhododendrons, you know, azaleas, which are, 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 are rhododendrons and uh, 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 Pieris and even abelia are that way and um, as I look around this yard there's certain viburnums that I wouldn't plant any other way my camellias I wouldn't plant uh, any other way uh, and then there's other things my um, hydrangea paniculatas I could throw those things in the clay I could throw them in the sand I could throw them anywhere probably and they wouldn't have a problem so that's something I just know but as a home gardener I would recommend in your clay soils get pine bark soil conditioner use about a third to a half um, uh, mixed in with whatever clay you pull out of the hole and then leave everything mounded up a little bit and then mulch and then pull back the mulch from the base of the plant so you're not mulching up on the stems and 99% uh, of the time uh, that's the best formula um, that I have found. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I get a lot of finding plants questions. This is, this is probably, especially in the last 18 months, been the absolute biggest question. And I sit here and, you know, I have... Uh, you know, friends down in the Gulf, and I have obviously a relationship with Southern Living Plant Collection and Encore, Encore Azaleas, you know, and I know Buddy Lee well, and uh, uh, who, who invented Encore Azaleas, and I'm sitting here talking about all these new and exciting plants in the last 18 months, nobody can find any of them because, you know, everybody stayed home and gardened, and, you know, they, they're buying them as fast as they're hitting the store shelves. And even beyond that, uh, some of these latest and greatest, newest introduction plants, um, it's sometimes hard to get nurserymen on board uh, with something. They've got, you know, they've got all their space, you know, spoken for, you know, I mean, I go to some giant nurseries, 200 acre nurseries, and they've got every square inch of that thing planned out for a year, maybe two years in advance. And you come in and you say, I got the latest and greatest thing. It's a little hard for them to plug it in. So a lot of times, you know, something, um, uh, something that I'm showing you that's new and exciting can take two or three years for nurserymen to kind of catch on to and catch up with. And we don't, just don't have anything in this business where we can stamp these things out. It's not like it's a, you know, an iPhone, you know, where they can just make, you know, hire more people on an assembly line and, and buy more raw materials. These plants take, these plants take time to produce. And so if I create a buzz or somebody else creates a buzz, you know, there's much larger YouTube channels in mind. It can create much larger buzzes uh, for a plant you know, it can wipe out a crop and then, you know, literally take 12 months, 18 months, 24 months uh, to replace those. The other thing is, <laughs> is that some plants are just slower in a nursery space. One of the questions on here was like Roman candles, podocarpus. That plant's just going to be um, out of this world. I don't have one like really close by to show you, but it's a podocarpus with white new growth on it. That plant's just going to, I think every one you could put in a garden center or box store anywhere in America, they'd sell immediately. It's just an awesome, awesome plant, but it's slow growing. 
And so some nurserymen have struggled with how, how to put it in their lineup. You know, where, where do you put this in? I got all these other things I can pot and six months later get money for. I got this other thing here that takes 18 months. And so that's a struggle uh, as well is that some of these things are just slower growing. So, but I think by fall, we'll start to see some of the nurserymen catching up a little bit. And I think by spring of 2021 and definitely by fall of, or 2022 and by fall of 2022, I think most of these things will be caught up with and we'll be able to find the things that I talk about or other people talk about. But um, th those, are some of, those are some of the reasons. It's, a lot of it is convincing nurserymen to put it into their, to their rotation and also the fact that so many gardeners um, are gardening in the last 18 months. I got a question about doing a video on heat zones and I will do a video on heat zones. It's been on my list for a long time and I promise I'll get to it sometime uh, later in the spring once I get everything planted out here in this yard. Uh, heat zones, for those of you who don't know, it's a weird, kind of a weird thing that we only talk about plants going in the ground based on how much cold they'll take. Oh, uh, because, uh, I mean, obviously winter um, is a significant player in the, you know, how, what, what plants will live and what plants will die, but also our summer heat is also a factor in that. So if I say that you know, someplace like, um, you know, Phoenix is zone nine. I don't know what it is, uh, but let's say Phoenix is zone nine. And then um, somewhere up the West Coast, you know, like San Francisco or something like that is, is zone nine. Those are two very different places in the summertime. Uh, so, so in the winter, in the winter time, you know, the, the, the temperatures are only dropping to about the same level. But in the summer, obviously Phoenix is as much as probably 60 degrees, 50 degrees higher on some days in the summertime than San Francisco would be. Um, and so heat zones uh, are something else that we should be putting on the labels to, to help, you know, to help people understand. It's especially important, I think, with conifers because frequently you'll see conifers that are from zone five to nine. Well, zone nine in Houston, you can't grow you know, a spruce, uh, you know, with that kind of heat, but up on the Pacific Northwest in some of zone nine areas, they can. And so that's where heat zones come into to effect is the, uh, the, you know, winter's not the only thing that can kill your plants. A desert is pretty good at killing plants as well. And so, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a video on heat zones and I, and I hope at one, at some, some day we'll see, we'll see the, uh, USDA, um, you know, cold, you know, cold hardiness zones uh, and the heat zones on every tag. And that would just help anyone that's living in Phoenix versus living in Raleigh, North Carolina, you know, to understand, you know, the, the difference um, between our summers, uh, which is significant. Okay, uh, let's see, somebody asked me for a vine that grows in the shade that isn't that aggressive. Now, most vines are, um, their intent in life is to be aggressive and to eat the things that they're on and get up to the sun as fast as possible, you know, and beat everything up into the top of the canopy. Um, but I, I love a, a five leaf akebia. They didn't say where they, where they were. And so if you don't put your zone on here, I don't really know, you know, where you're, where you're at. So I, I don't know if uh, some of the things I would recommend, I skip a lot of those questions where somebody didn't include a zone just because, you know, I don't know where you live. <laughs> so it's hard for me to recommend something. Um, but, uh, I love five leaf akebia or chocolate vine. Uh, that's one of the uh, uh, sh shade vines that's my go-to that not a, not everyone uses. Beautiful um, chocolate brown flowers uh, this time of year in the uh, spring, and then really beautiful foliage on it the rest of the um, the rest of the season. Okay, um, uh, let's see. So oh, somebody bought some bare root plants. I'm gonna do a couple more here. Somebody bought some bare root plants, uh, clematis. That's what it was, bare root clematis, and put them directly in the ground. Only one of them is growing so far. They think the other two are dead, and they wanted my opinion of whether or not I would have put those in containers first. Yes, I put pretty much all bare root plants that I've ever purchased in a container before I put it in the ground. Uh, I've, in fact, I don't ever know. I may be wrong, but I don't think that even once in my life have I bought a bare root plant and put it directly uh, in the ground in 35 years of, of doing this, but I may be wrong. Uh, I probably am not remembering sometime, but normally, even if I got like bare root strawberries, I would put them in a container. Bare root roses, I'd put them in a container. Bare root trees, I'd definitely put in containers. Um, all of these things I did at my nursery, I'd buy them bare root and put them in containers and then sell them to other people, root it out. Uh, rather than directly in the ground. That doesn't mean that you can't have success planting bare root plants in the ground. I'm not saying you can't, but I would prefer to buy a bare root plant, put it in a container for 
two, three, four weeks, let it get some new roots on it, and then stick it in the ground. Um, I, I think they transition much better. But again, it doesn't mean you can't have success the other way. Uh, okay. Um, uh, last question uh, for this week, and there were tons and tons of questions from the video last week. There's a number of people watching the videos right now. Thank you guys all for watching and participating and you know, everything else uh, on the channel. But um, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> but these were, the, the, these were good ones, uh, and, and, and thank you. And you can ask questions down below, and in a couple weeks, I'll be back with another um, question and answer video. Uh, but the last one that I picked from this week was somebody has a dead butterfly bush in Houston and because uh, they had 12 degree night or whatever it was and wanted to know if butterfly bushes um, hated the cold. No, actually butterfly bushes are much hardier than 12 degrees. Butterfly bushes can grow up into Canada. The reason that they die in the south uh, in the winter time is because they don't go fully dormant. And I, I can't remember if I've ever talked about this or not on the channel. Maybe I have. I know I've talked about it with other nurserymen. It's an interesting thing. I'm riding on the Gulf uh, Coast uh, back in February, early February, and right along from the from the Florida Panhandle over to Louisiana. They can have winter damage on container plants down there uh, that are super, super cold hardy plants when they just get barely cold. So they can get 29 degrees and their butterfly bushes die in containers. They split down at the bottom and crack. Uh, and the reason for that is they're just not dormant. There's still water in the stems. Whereas if you had that butterfly bush in Canada or upper, the upper UP of Michigan, it would be dormant. I mean, completely dormant, no water in the stems. It would have pulled everything down to the roots. And so the cold just doesn't matter to it. But down on the Gulf Coast, a lot of times things just don't go to sleep and it leaves them vulnerable uh, to cold damage. And so that's what's happening there. The plant's still kind of awake, and, and then the water inside the stem freezes, and that expands, that water expands and cracks the stems. Okay, uh, thank you guys for participating. Um, the uh, Subscriber Sunday video will be the first Sunday in May. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and uh, like and comment and um, all those things on the videos because that's what helps the channel grow. Thanks for watching.